So you can open up your Bible to Nehemiah chapter 4. And we'll start at verse, I think it's uh, 15. There we are. So Nehemiah 4, verse 15. I want to look at um, this man Nehemiah again to see what's going on. I want to look at some observation and then we'll look at some application. So you can go home and put some of these things to practice. <coughs> Nehemiah chapter 4. 15, when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail, and the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely, widely spread and we're separated on the wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound, of the trumpet, rally to us there, our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at the time, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night, and may labor by day. So neither I, nor my brothers, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes, each kept his weapon at his right hand. I always wonder, what is there in this text for us today? I think there's plenty. Let's get some observations on this text right here. Uh, they had stopped work. And they dealt with some opposition in verse 14. You, you like to have a little context. Uh, verse 14, he says, I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Talking about Sam Bella. And they were planning on uh, sneaking in at night and overpowering them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your your homes. Remember last week I said, it's all in God's hands, but you don't sit on your hands. Okay, so that's really important when you see this text. But now the work had stopped. It had stopped. The work on the wall had stopped to acknowledge protest, assess the progress, and manage the process. So the work stopped to uh, acknowledge protest, assess the progress, and manage the process. That's good. Sometimes you and I need to stop what we're doing and ask the question, why are we doing what we're doing? Have you ever just been hurling along at a breakneck pace and, and you really feel like you're on track, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, and you might just want to stop when there are some obstacles, some things coming at you. Stop and acknowledge that there's protests going on. There, there's something happening to, to question, to, to be against what I'm doing. And at that point, you assess the progress. And that's what they did. Okay, what are we doing here? We, we got Sam Ballot. He wants to come against us. And then, so... Nehemiah sits everybody down and he says, what are we doing here? And he reaffirms that God has promised that he would be there to protect them. He made this promise. So he refreshes. He goes back and he says, look, remember, God said he would fight our battle for us. That's really important. 
Where are we? Why are we doing what we're doing? Well, remember you guys when he promised us, and Nehemiah was so good. The reason we're talking about Nehemiah is we're talking about leadership. Do you have homes? Do you have things that you're, you're in charge of? Uh, are you on track to obey God? Are you on track to follow him? Is the place you're at in life where you believe God is leading you? Do you ever have opposition to what you're doing? I mean, today? Yeah, I bet you have already. If you have kids, it's pretty much instantaneous. First thing in the morning. The first word. I, I do like the, and this is anecdote, the mother wakes up the son, says it's time to go to church, and the son replies, I'm not going, the people aren't nice, I find it difficult there, I, I come home depressed, worse than when I got there, and he goes on ranting how bad it is, the opposition and the difficulties, and the mother says, son, you have to get up, you're the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you meet these obstacles. Well, what happened here was, after they got through assessing what was going on, like, yeah, this, yeah we heard God. We, we know that he's promised. Guess what they did? They made some changes. Changes can be made. Adjustments, additions, subtractions. Have you ever done that? When you got through assessing what's going on, you go, well, we need to make some changes here. Our goal's not changing I'm still heading this direction, but I'm making some changes. You ever done that? I have. So in the case of Nehemiah, they could look back on specific promises God had given them to have victory over the enemy. Then they engaged, they joined together because they were of one mind. How do I know that? Go back to chapter 4, verse 6. They had a mind to do the work. So they, they put their hands to work, but it was up here. That's where the battle's at. They had a mind to work. They were of one mind. The goal didn't change, but after affirming and refreshing the goal, they were changes that were made. Verse 15 reflects that the enemy, seeing the effect of the changes, God had frustrated their plans. So Nehemiah says, God frustrated the enemy's plans. Because you, you couldn't get their eye off the goal. Danny, eye on the ball. Be the ball, Danny. Keep your mind. Work the play. Even if you have to make changes. The Jews returned to their work and changes were implemented, but the goal stayed the same. Sometimes you have to stop your progress and assess the protest and maybe make changes in the process. But here's the deal. Sometimes you might have made a mistake. May I see the hand of everybody who's made a mistake? Well, th thanks kids, that, that's awesome. And the ones who didn't, you just made one. <laughs> David had good intentions. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, he wanted to move the ark. Hey, here's a great plan. It's, it was religious. It was a religious thing. So he's going to move the ark, and he's going to take it back to where he thinks it should be. And remember Uzzah, one of the volunteers? Great. I'm so glad that anything that we've done, we've never had one of the volunteers die. <laughs> so, you know, well, there he is. You know, the, the wagon took a bump and Uzzah reached up and kazam, he zapped, he dies. That's when David say, said, okay, just a minute here. <laughs> so he parked it and he went and he reassessed. Okay, what have I done? And if you read on in the text, you see they changed how they went about doing it. Didn't change the goal, but he said, we got to make some changes here. Sometimes you don't stop. You want, you want to keep on going because sometimes the enemy is, is on you. You remember Peter when he was walking on the water? <laughs> what did he do? He doubted. Remember? He should have just kept his eye on Jesus and kept on walking. So now that's up to you to discern the difference. And you need to have the Holy Spirit in you 
And you need to trust the Lord and be in the word and discern the difference between the times when you want to stop and the times that you've got an enemy who's on you and he's got you in his sight and you just keep on, okay? So there's a difference. Sometimes you want to stop, sometimes you don't. There's a time to pause and there's a time when you keep going. What if you're building a house and you just decide to quit all of a sudden? Oh. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> you know boy pretty soon if it's at the wrong time and see, people see a foundation out there for 18 years ago well whoever was thinking there you know they should have got going on it but maybe they planned poorly Steve has it Steve's been really at it hard so way to go Steve yeah. cool. I'll give it to everybody <laughs> come on there's a time to pause and there's times you keep going be discerning. So how can you be discerning? What has God given you to help you with that discernment? Well, you got the word. But you know what I can do, y'all? I can go to the Bible. I can find the things I like. You know? Think prosperity gospel. Mm-hmm. Not of the Lord. No. But what has God given you besides the word? You know, I'm not my own best judge. You're not your own best judge. He's given you a team. He's given you people. The Bible says that there's wisdom in the multitude of counsel. There's a time when you, you give attention ear. You listen. You say, hey, I'm thinking about this. Well, Nehemiah did. Verse 16, Nehemiah had a closer bunch of guys working with him. He wasn't on his own. So here's my second principle. I already told you one. Well, here's another one. Do have others in your life. Don't be alone. You aren't the Lone Ranger. And even he had Tonto. <laughs> what do you mean? We, white man, what is that? that <laughs> when the Indians are attacking and what are we going to do, Tonto? What do you mean we? I'm sorry, that just clicked in there. From <laughs> Don't be a lone ranger. Even Jesus had the three closest, Peter, James, and John. Do you remember that? Yes, he had expectation that these three men were going to be with him. Matthew chapter 26, Jesus was praying, and he comes back to his bros, the guys that were supposed to be with him, and they've nodded off. And he says, couldn't you even pray for one hour, guys? Could, couldn't you even pray with me for one hour? Okay, this is God's son, God in the flesh. And he looks to human beings to be part of his inner group to support. So he had an expectation. Look, Nehemiah did. Jesus did. You need to have somebody in your life. Accountability is so important. I know that's a four-letter word for a lot of people. But it's really important. I have seen more guys go off track because they were on their own and they had nobody that could call them into account for some commitments that they made in their life, some goals, and spiritual goals they made in their life. And they just went on their own and pretty soon a failed marriage, pretty soon you're looking at visitation weekends, pretty soon, you know, their life has gone to pot because there was nobody else that they could bounce things off of. Someone who was honest with them. And I talked about that last week. Somebody can put up with your stuff be honest with you. I can't talk for gals. What do you do? You know, I'm just talking. You need somebody. You need somebody. And you say, well, I got my spouse. I'm sorry, that doesn't cut the mustard. <laughs> that does not work. Because I know from experience, I can discount what my wife says. And wives can do the same thing. Because they know me too well. Right? Okay. So develop that set of closer people. Find a team you can walk this faith walk with. And the reason for these first two guides for life, and I mention them again, sometimes you have to stop your progress, assess the protest, and maybe make changes in the process. One. Number two, do have others in your life. Don't be alone. Don't be alone. And then be alert because the enemy will always be looking for weakness to exploit. 
Always be on the alert because the enemy is going to be look, looking for weaknesses in your life and my life for weaknesses to exploit. He is. And that's what was happening here. Sam Ballot and the, the bad guys, they're looking. They would have taken advantage of everything they could, they could have to go and find the weakness in the wall to attack. So Nehemiah, he has this guy. Each of the builders, verse 18, each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while, while he built and then skipping on. And I said, in the place where you hear the sound, verse 20 of the trumpet, rally to us here. Our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work. Half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. So they got, what they did was they, they got a night shift going. They, they had a day shift and they had a night shift. So I'm going to move into one of the things that we observe about Nehemiah. He modeled good leadership. He wasn't just picking up the trowel and the sword. He didn't just do that. He was there looking with his head on a swivel, looking for the enemy. Where is Sam Ballot looking at us? Where is our wall weak? Where do we need to put some guys out? Where have we, where have we thinned our ranks? Even talk to guys in the town, said, you come and stay with us at night. We got vittles. We got protection. So come and be with us. So instantly, you, you have their ranks increase, and Sam Ballot would have seen that. And who worked harder than anybody else? Nehemiah and the team. <laughs> you know, the, the guys... Uh, everybody's going to the cafeteria at, at five, six o'clock. They put in a good day's work. And where's Nehemiah? Where's Nehemiah? And you hear his voice out there. Hey, come on, guys. Come on, night crew. Let me get you going. Maybe when they're putting their head on the pillow, they hear Nehemiah out there going, hey, you guys with the torch. Move it over here. We got to keep this wall straight. Come on, guys. Hey, get some... Hey, hod carrier, get some mortar up there to Jedekiah. He's about out. Come on. Let's work together. He was out there. He was a great model of leadership. He was out watching for a place where the enemy could exploit the weakness. And he was out modeling leadership, helping out, guiding everybody else. That's a great leader. I want to be a leader like that. Oh, this one guy here in verse 18, maybe built like a Barney Fife, I don't know. And he said, you carry the horn, you carry this, the trumpet, not like Louis Armstrong had, brass. How many of you know what a shafar is? Okay, anybody watch TV yesterday on this return thing? Anybody? Okay, they were blowing shafars, they were a ram's horn. So I think this guy would have had this thing strapped to him. But wherever Nehemiah went, this guy was with him all the time. This one little guy was with Nehemiah all the time. <laughs> and, and, I mean, he was just watching him. That's all he had to do was watch Nehemiah. Had to be by Nehemiah all the time because Nehemiah was looking up for where there was weaknesses. And he was going to tap that guy on the head, blow the trumpet, you know, get those guys here. That's all that guy had to do. A pastor's like that. You, you take your leaders, and, and they're always looking for, in the church, where, where's their weakness? Where do we see the, the devil trying to attack our body? Now, you know, I want to teach good doctrine. Here's something about good doctrine. Doctrine, uh, doctrinal, uh, get the right word. Doctrinal, doctrine, <laughs> hang on, guys. You guys quit looking at me for a second. <laughs> Doctrinal directions give you moral imperatives. That's all I wanted to say. You have good doctrine, you're going to have moral imperatives. You go, how am I supposed to behave in this environment? Good doctrine is going to be taught at church. We're going to open up the word and we're going to find out what it says. We're not going to stray off into new age stuff, trendy stuff. We want to just go back to what the word says. It doesn't mean I'm always going to say the right thing. No, but I'm going to do my best to study to, to do it, you know, because I want to watch out for where something, something's sneaking in. 
that, that might affect our body. You know, I can find a good scripture for this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, when, when Peter writes, Be careful, your adversary roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Man, I'm watching. And I'm praying. I, I got my prayer guide. And I, I lift you guys up all the time, by name, individually. Because I want to, you know, in the New Testament, it's like shepherd. I want to be one of Jesus' shepherds that watches out for the flock, his people. You're not my people. You're God's people. But I don't want to be like a hireling and not be watching out for the enemy. And I want to model I'm going to model the life of Christ to you. That's good, that, that's good leadership. We should do that. I like what we were talking about in Sunday school. Boy, what a meeting today. John, you just grabbed the tiger by the tail. And we talked about these things in Titus. You know, what makes a leader? What, what makes a leader that the Bible wants to have in place? Those are important things. But here's something about, <laughs> are you ready for this? Here's something about leadership. Verse 23. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon on at his right hand. So I've, I've told you sometimes you have to stop your progress and assess the protests and maybe make changes in the process. You don't want to be on your own. You're supposed to have a team around you that you can have bounce things off of. Be alert because the enemy will always be looking for weaknesses to exploit. But here's the deal with leadership. <laughs> Pretty soon, they're going to have an odor. <laughs> yeah, Dixie, no. I, I worked with her for 10 years, and she's back. She's the only one laughing. Because <laughs> she knows. She's been with me. Pretty soon. <laughs> what did you say, Dixie? <laughs> so these guys, you, what does somebody smell like after a while of not taking a bath and not... Uh, this guy, he's going, you know, these guys are awesome. I'm in with Nehemiah and his team. They're cool, but man, if they would just take a bath. They, wow, and Nehemiah, especially because he's always lifting his arms, pointing at the wall. <laughs> and I'm down here. And, and listen, you're going to be around leadership and you're going to see our clay feet. You're going to see that we have flaws. None of us, you know, in leadership as a pastor, none of us ever say, well, I'm perfect. I'm I'm like God's anointed, and you got to do what I say. No, <laughs> I, I've come with you with my foibles, my, my weaknesses, but every time I fall down, I'm going to be falling down towards Christ. And I do take a bath. It's so funny, Lynn says, yeah, you always bring up these scripture about smell, and you don't have one. I don't, so I, I just can't imagine, you know. But, but I know that you see me for who I am. And this was Nehemiah. They were so dedicated to the cause. They said, I'm not taking a, I'm not changing clothes. You think Sam Ballot isn't out there watching me right now, the enemy? It's that important, having a sword. And that, that little guy with the horn, he goes, I know where I want to be when it goes south. I want to be in the middle with Nehemiah and his guys, because they're ready. Okay, I want you to be willing to stop sometime and say, why am I doing what I'm doing? Evaluate the progress. Assess it. Is this where the Lord wants me? And if you're sure, you know, and you've got uh, backing up with scripture and you've got people who said, yeah, this is, boy, that's, that's wise. You know, you might have to change some things, but don't change your goal. Press on towards, uh, living like Christ and pleasing him with your life. Don't forget that. And also, don't be on your own. That, that's the point. You've got to have somebody that you're, you're listening to. The word, others, wise counsel. And then be alert because you've got a real enemy and he wants to divide the body of Christ. Just like Sam Ballot and those guys, they would love to have gone in there and scattered the Jews and breached the wall, and messed up what they had done. They were obeying God. They had followed the Lord's direction. So, and don't forget, pretty soon, you're gonna be by lively stones, and you're gonna smell something. That's your, the person you're next to. 
You go, yeah, there's weaknesses in all of us. But as we trust God for his work, take, take heed. There's so many verses about take heed. And I'll finish up those, just a couple of them. In uh, Mark 13, 23, take heed, behold, I've told you everything in advance. The Lord tells you, be alert. Um, a great one. Hebrews 3.12, take care, brethren, that there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Just be alert. Be alert. Stay sharp. All right, if you would, would you stand? And I'm going to pray and we'll be dismissed. Thank you for uh, Hebrews 2.1, Lord, where it says, for this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so we do not drift away from it. Recognize that we are flesh, we can, we can fall, but just draw close to the Lord constantly day by day as the days grow more wicked. Lord Jesus, would you please help us to uh, just pay attention. Uh, have other Christians in our life that know the word and, and are living, walking with you faithfully that we can bounce things off of. Uh, help us also to sometimes stop and pause and Make sure we're on the right track and, and uh, move on in faith when we have the enemy in our way. And then, Lord, that uh, we would give each other grace that n none of us here are perfect, uh, but Jesus Christ is, and, and uh, he lives in us, and he desires us to press in. You desire us, Lord, to press in so that our lives will be pleasing to you. Commit this, this people to you this week and pray that you'd lead them, guide them, help them to just look to you every day when they face the difficulties of life because it can sure get rough. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a song to sing.